Hey everybody and welcome back to the Kodiak Shack podcast. Uh, today we have Norris. He's from Exosonic and he's working on uh, Quiet Supersonic as well as uh, Supersonic uh, Trainers, Supersonic Combat Collaborative Aircraft, Supersonic uh, Commercial Airliners. So a lot of cool stuff. Uh, remember uh, for the Kodiak Shack side of the house. Like, share, subscribe. Tell all your friends, even though Tron says uh, everybody already knows that they need to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, but we appreciate it. And, uh, you know, the more people you tell, the more the podcast gets out there and we can uh, inform more people. Kodiak Shack hats are available on the website. And uh, I can't even remember the last thing. But either way, Norris, thank you for being here. And uh, tell us about yourself. Cool, Vader. Thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh... You know, making, making this happen. Uh, but a little bit about myself. So again, just to reintroduce myself, Norris T, CNO, co-founder of Exosonic. And I've had a lifelong passion uh, for high-speed travel. I grew up in the Bay Area, California, had uh, relatives overseas and uh, wanted to figure out a way to get to them faster just because I was really tired of 12 plus hour flights across the Pacific Ocean and thought there's got to be a faster way to do this. Uh, and so that motivated my professional career, my academic education, uh, studied aerospace engineering at UCLA with a focus on propulsion, uh, worked in the industry for a couple of years at Skunk Works, Virgin Galactic and Northrop Grumman, all on vehicles that broke the sound barrier, going from Mach 1 to Mach 5. And um, ultimately found my way into Stanford's Graduate School of Business to start Exosonic and really chase this childhood passion of mine, high-speed transport uh, through the company Exosonic. Um, as Vader that, uh, said earlier, we started off with quiet supersonic airliners so they can fly supersonic everywhere, not just over water. And then we've recently uh, moved more towards supersonic UAVs to tackle the collaborative combat aircraft, aerial targets, and adversary air training missions, given the near-term time horizons uh, for that product line. Awesome. So how was it, uh, I mean, working at Skunk Works, everybody kind of knows about Skunk Works now, but there was a period of time where Skunk Works, you know, was, a, was super secret back in the day. But how was that kind of getting to experience uh, working at a obviously massive organization? Uh, so what was your kind of niche and role while there? Yeah. Yeah. Interestingly, I worked primarily on the only unclassified program uh, in Palmdale <laughs> Skunk Works, which is the X-59 uh, it's a NASA-funded vehicle built by Lockheed Martin, and it's it's going to demonstrate uh, quiet supersonic technologies or low boom technologies, as they say. Where this vehicle is actually going to fly, hopefully early next year, uh, and it's shaped using these low boom uh, shaping techniques that have been developed by NASA and in the industry for the past couple of decades, uh, and really de demonstrating that you can indeed shape a sonic boom to be quiet enough that it doesn't disturb people below you. Um, they say that it's going to be like a car door slamming or distant rolling thunder um, that in terms of uh, how loud it will be and therefore hopefully be okay with everyone below. Yeah, and then for, uh, for everybody kind of not well-versed in the uh, super and hypersonic, uh, can you kind of explain like what it means to break the speed of sound and supersonic and all that fun stuff? Yeah, yeah. So when you're going supersonic, uh, that means you're going above the speed of sound. Uh, Mach 1 is typically what we say as the speed of sound, and so you're exceeding Mach 1. Now, when you think about breaking the sound barrier, what's really happening is that um, as you travel at subsonic speeds, you think about sound waves. And if you remember back in your middle school physics class, sound waves are really just uh, compression and expansion waves in the air or some kind of medium happens in water or air or anything else, you know, even surfaces and things like that. But basically, um, as you travel faster and faster, closer to Mach 1, these sound waves uh, start to compress onto each other. And pretty soon when you reach Mach 1, there's really nowhere to go. Uh, and so that's what makes it really difficult to break that sound barrier, because all of these sound waves are compressing onto each other, forming this pressure barrier in a way. And then that makes it really hard for the vehicle to, you know, break against all this buildup of pressure. Now, when you finally exceed Mach 1, you break through that pressure. And what happens is the air, basically, um, when you go past it, you leave this vacuum in a way. Uh, and then the air rushes in to fill it. 
And then that's what creates this loud sonic boom. All that uh, pressure that was built up is now released after you break that sound barrier. And then that releases the sonic booms that are really uh, uh, famous when you break the sound barrier. Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, I always, I always jokingly say like, oh, you know, ripping holes in the sky. Uh, because you do the, you break the speed of sound and, and it sounds like it, you kind of tore the sky in the parks. Uh, yeah. but yeah. that's what, you know, people always ask like, you know, flying fighters, like, Oh, what's it like to break the speed of sound? And in today's fighters, I mean, you know, like Chuck Yeager and stuff, that was a high threat, you know, endeavor to get beyond the speed of sound. But nowadays, uh, thanks to gentlemen like yourself, uh, it is anticlimactic, you know, uh, the <laughs> other day we have, we have some airspace, that you cannot go supersonic because we don't we don't have the quiet boom technology just yet. And uh, I like look down and I was like, oh, I'm above the speed of sound. And I like pull my power back because uh, I was a little too fast in the uh, slow airspace. Um, <laughs> so the uh, I lost my train of thought because I was telling too many stories. But the uh, so when you're doing this, one of the things that I hadn't thought about until I started flying supersonic aircraft was the actual nature of the air flowing over an aircraft so the mm -hmm. way lift is created the way motors work you now once you break the speed of sound all bets are off right so everything has to change your lift surfaces have to be capable of exceeding the speed of sound and then in addition your motor needs air that is subsonic is that accurate yeah yeah so when you look at uh between you know your subsonic airliners or like your 737 uh, versus your fighter jets, and this is specifically about the engines for this part, you can see the engines just hanging off the wing of a 737, right? It's just there with a big, you know, turbo fan in the front. Uh, and whereas when you look at fighter jets, uh, you don't you don't see the engine, right? You see a, a gaping hole, like a mouth, if you will, uh, that basically sucks in the air. Now, uh, there's a number of reasons for that one is sometimes stealth, you want to do that. But uh, another main phenomenon is that you use that kind of mouth area to compress the air, slow it down from, you know, supersonic speeds down to subsonic speeds. Uh, and that's that way the engine can ingest subsonic uh, air again, and then combust that, right? Compress that through the fans and then, and then ultimately combust that and create the thrust. So absolutely. Um, when you go even faster, uh, like Mach 3, then you have ramjets, which is using you know ram air, ram, the air that's coming in, ramming into the, the mouth, if you will. And you have to compress that even more uh, and slow that down even more to get to subsonic speeds and still combust it. Now, <clears throat> then you get to hypersonics, right, which is really cool, where you can actually have supersonic air coming in. There's still some ways you can slow it down, but you're still combusting it at supersonic speed. So when you think about scramjet, it stands for a supersonic combusting ramjet. That's the SC in front. Uh, so that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's what because I've seen. Uh, I don't know how to say it. Hermes. Uh, Hermes yeah, Hermes. Uh, yeah, Hermes. Yeah, the mm -hmm. uh, the company that's working on a combo motor where they effectively have a subsonic air flowing through. They get up to speed and then they kind of like change it to where the engine compartment now just becomes a tunnel in which they take supersonic air and compress it via the shape of the tunnel, I assume, and then ignite. And then it's not, it seems, I mean, that's some wild stuff. Yeah. So and the, uh, SR Blackbird, you know, was one of the original turbo ramjets in the what 1970s or something. And yeah. that, that thing was an amazing propulsion system for sure. Yeah, well, and I thought it was cool that the SR-71, that those cones, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of stick out of the front of the intakes, as it got faster and faster, those codes would extend farther and farther, kind of doing exactly that, slowing down that air, air kind of making that air travel around something to get into the intakes. Uh, mm -hmm. So, man, I appreciate smart people. Thank you for that. The uh, <laughs> So, so um what made you kind of, obviously you're working on this stuff at Lockheed and then you decide, hey, I'm going to hop out, start Exosonic. What was the driving force um, that kind of got you to start your own company? Yeah, yeah. So I'd really, you know, credit my childhood passion for faster transportation or, you know, colloquially high speed transportation uh, and trying to figure out what ways I can make that happen. So 
you know, ever since high school, I've wanted to figure out more about how to start a company. Um, and so when I was an undergraduate, um, I looked into entrepreneurship, tried to get in touch with the community there, build up a network and just learn more about how to develop myself personally uh, to make those like have those skills. Right. Go meeting, uh, go meet people, talk to people that I wasn't familiar with um, and build relationships. Uh, that's not things that, you know, naturally come from an engineering course load. But I wanted to make sure that um, I got that in my undergraduate degree just from my own experiences. Um, and while I worked in industry, I wanted to understand the technical uh, information to propel vehicles faster. That's why I focused on propulsion, because I wanted to understand how engines work. Um, how do they propel vehicles faster? What makes a supersonic airplane supersonic, right? And that's why I know some of this propulsion uh, airframe integration stuff that I spoke about earlier. And um, when I got into business school, I thought that was the right jumping off point. Uh, I got what I wanted from industry, not only built up somewhat of a mentor network, but also gain some knowledge about how propulsion systems work within airframes. Um, but I always knew that I wasn't going to be like a chief engineer. I wanted to be someone that was going to be running a business versus doing the technical work. So I got the technical knowledge that I thought I well, was adequate to do, you know, to run a company in the aerospace uh, industry. And then business school gave me the, the knowledge and the network uh, to launch the company. Well, and that's one of the questions I kind of had for you was how different was it from just being an engineer working on producing the product to, oh man, I have to run a company now. Cause you have, <laughs> you have many people working at your company now. And, and so dealing with all of the fires rather than just the singular fire of producing the product, like how, how different was that from just being an engineer? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, there's a, definitely a lot of changes. I don't really do anything math related anymore. Whereas when I was in engineering, I was doing a lot of math related stuff. Um, I guess the only math I do now is just, you know, your four major equation or four major operations, right? Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division for my accounting and financial projections. <laughs> That's kind of about yeah. it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I had to grow a whole new set of skills um, and just, in terms of the people that I met too, right? I never worked with anyone in the DOD before. Being an engineer, I was never customer facing. So I think that was that was a pretty big um, hurdle for me to, to jump through. Uh, I remember going to my first AFA conference in I think 2019. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've never seen so many people in uniform in my life. And it was really <laughs> intimidating at first. And now I go and I know some people there, so it's a little bit more friendly. Uh, but going there for the first time, not knowing anyone and trying to stick out somehow was, was pretty intimidating. But going back to what I talked about earlier about preparing myself personally, you know, these are all skills that I honed back in undergrad, being comfortable speaking with people, uh, voicing, you know, my opinions out there in front of an audience uh, and just, you know, talking to strangers. Uh, it became something that I got to really hone over time and, you know, grew more comfortable uh, other than growing a network in, a, in an industry that I'm not very uh, familiar with, uh, doing business development is totally new, doing HR, interviewing people, um, you know, performance reviews, compensation, all this other stuff, strategy, roadmap stuff, um, ultimately doing pivots, right, to put the business in a better position uh, in the short term and certainly with a focus on the long term. All those things, uh, business school gave me some uh, foundational knowledge on, but when it comes to the practicalities of execution, um, you know, those are all things that I had to learn, um, you know, obviously with my co-founder and CTO, who I also met at Stanford, uh, but we all learned this together. And yeah, it was, <laughs> I've grown in so many different ways. I feel like I'm, well, I feel like I can do anything uh, in a way. Um, at the very least, I'm open to doing anything nowadays, more so than when I was an engineer. Well, it's funny. I was I was having a conversation with a friend the other day, and and I was making the argument that, you know, your brain, like when you take a challenge, you you have an undertaking that is difficult, and you succeed, 
you get that positive response, like chemically in your brain, that like you <laughs> get positive feedback. And I was like, which begets you wanting more challenges, you know, and this kind of becomes a, like a, like a, a good cycle, you know, not a vicious cycle in that way. And so I think that's, that's great where rather than just kind of staying at home in your, in your engineering niche, you, you try to tackle other problems and, and try to, you know, better yourself in, in other areas. So getting, getting to the aircraft that Exosonic makes, uh, one, they look super sick. So uh, that's a win because that's step one, look good. Step two, uh, go uh, quiet supersonic. Um, so I guess I assume the shape, the styling, all that stuff has to do with the quiet supersonic or quiet boom. Mm -hmm. uh, so how did you build that out? And then kind of how did it get that look? Like what engineering side drove that shape? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So on a quiet supersonic airliner, um, you know, obviously we want to do something that was transport size, so carrying tens of passengers versus a business jet. So naturally, it's going to be a, a fairly long aircraft. But the thing is, when you try to incorporate low boom technologies into an airframe, uh, it stretches out the vehicle a little bit longer. Now, uh, as you'll see with the X-59 and some prior uh, low boom experimentations in flight, there's typically an extended nose. And that helps to more gradually, um, you know, let that shockwave, you know, fill in that gap uh, that we talked about earlier. And in addition, it spreads out those shockwaves a little bit more, um, well, not naturally per se, it's actually very carefully designed. The entire airframe is carefully designed such that the shockwaves that just naturally come off the vehicle do so in a very predictable manner and in specific parts of the aircraft. That way, when these shockwaves go towards the earth, they, in a way, coalesce and kind of, you know, dampen themselves out over, over that distance in time. Um, so a characteristic, again, is that long nose, but there's many other aspects of the aircraft that need to be considered. Certainly the wings, uh, in addition to the, the tails in the back, uh, the engine placement as well, because those will all contribute to uh, shockwave signatures. Uh, and so being mindful of how those are shaped in addition to the overall, you know, completing of the mission, right? You don't want to just maximize the performance for low boom. You want to maximize the performance for many other aspects as well and, and balance them out, right? So we got to consider low boom in addition to the range of the vehicle, the propulsion efficiency of the aircraft uh, and things like that. And all of those considerations put together create the shape that you saw or you can see in our website. And I'll say, obviously the engineering is still not done, right? There's most likely gonna be configuration changes as the tools that we use are higher fidelity. You know, when you think about um, crafting a sculpture, for example, you start with some rough chisel uh, tools, right? Try to get the general shape of what it looks like and feels like. And then over time, you use the more finer tools to actually get that final piece. And that's very true of the engineering process as well. What I would assume not knowing, so I'm going to ask the expert, uh, does creating the shape that um, aligns with like a quiet boom also align with fuel efficiency, uh, like creating lift? Uh, or were you finding areas where you were struggling to get the lift you needed or to get the efficiency you needed and keep the quiet? Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, the, those are all really um, big considerations in balancing uh, those those different prior competing priorities. Uh, so, you know, low boom in a way, like you're stretching the aircraft, right? Which if you're stretching it, then you're most likely going to have to add some weight. When you do that, you have to balance that weight out, right? Try to get the right center of gravity, center of pressure across the aircraft. Uh, and so uh, having low boom doesn't it doesn't come for free, as they say in the aircraft world. Um, so, yes, there are many considerations that had to go into uh, shaping the vehicle, the wings, you know, empennage, things like that, to make sure that it would incorporate low boom without detrimenting other aspects of the vehicle's performance. And then how does the, because everybody who kind of thinks commercial supersonic probably thinks back to the Concorde previously. So how does today's technology, today's aircraft, like at Exosonic, how would that compare to a Concorde style, you know, uh, commercial supersonic airliner? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite incredible what they did in the 1960s, 
uh, and how they were able to produce the Concorde in the first place. I mean, certainly a vehicle ahead of its time. And I, I think it would still be advanced even in today's standards. Um, some differences that have certainly evolved over the past, I mean, almost 60 years. I think the 50th anniversary of first flight is coming up, uh, the Concorde. And uh, I'll say a number of things, right? I, the way that we design airplanes, that whole methodology has completely uh, evolved, where it's a lot of heavy computational efforts so that we can do a lot of simulation um, in the computer. And those simulations on the computer are more accurate when they, uh, more accurate now than they were back in the 1960s, just because of the plethora of data that we have and the amount of tools that we have that are already, you know, just better defined from better physics models that we do have. Um, in addition to that, propulsion efficiency has increased tremendously. I mean, the industry has been eking out as like every percentage of fuel efficiency as they can from turbofan engines these days. Now, the big difference is that we won't be using a an afterburning engine uh, for a takeoff because that just day. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> uh, it just takes up too much fuel um, and you know you want to make sure that you have good fuel economy and you know we're dumping fuel into the <laughs> into the exhaust to burn it. It's not necessarily the most fuel efficient, but it does create some awesome flames and, and a lot of cool noise. Um, so that's going to be one big difference. And of course, the low boom technology that we want to incorporate into the airframe. The Concorde was uh, famous or infamous uh, for that uh, sonic boom and potentially not only rattling windows, but maybe even breaking windows. And that's something that we certainly think needs to be eliminated to make a commercially viable uh, supersonic transport aircraft. Yeah. Well, and uh, I kind of saw on the website that a quiet supersonic jet now doesn't have to just live transcontinental. You know, it doesn't just fly over the Atlantic or the Pacific. It can fly, you know, in the continental United States and not, like you said, blow out the windows. Which, uh, so if anybody's interested in hearing supersonic uh, or sonic booms, uh, just go to Holloman Air Force Base on a Friday and the <laughs> F-16s are happy to break the sound because uh, it's Sonic Boom Fridays, obviously. And uh, one of my buddies, he would, uh, kind of going back to how Sonic Booms work, it's kind of directional is my understanding. Mm -hmm. So he would actually get nice and high and then point straight down at the base because our airspace was directly over the base and then break the speed of sound like on the way towards the base and then kind of square the corner right before he got to the bottom of the airspace just to like really hit home, literally, because he lived on base. And uh, and all my neighbors who I also lived on base, they'd hear the sonic booms and they'd be like, screw you. And just <laughs> shoot me a text, you know, I'm like, hey, happy, happy Friday. So, uh, yeah, pretty awesome stuff. So then you you have this idea of this uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, of this commercial uh, quiet supersonic aircraft. And then you now talking uh, about what you did previously about pivot. And then you say, hey. How, how is there a DOD use for this? So how did you kind of make that transition uh, into working with the DOD on building them some uh, a UAV? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, you know, actually, thankfully, the airliner was kind of our first segue into the DOD, uh, or more specifically, the Air Force through some open topic STTRs or um, small business tech transfer research, uh, not grants, but contracts. Uh, and the SBIR project, Small Business Innovation Research uh, Contracts. And, um, you know, we, we did that. And then we as a business decided, okay, look, an airline is going to cost upwards of a couple billion dollars, right, to go from design all the way to certification of a airworthy vehicle uh, and take probably like 10 to 15 years, right? Uh, that's not necessarily, at least from our standpoint, what we think could help set up set us up for success. Obviously, there's other companies out there that have gone down that path and raised quite a bit of money, um, but I still think it's a long journey for them to finally reach commercial success. <clears throat> and so it was that issue that was the motivation behind pivoting towards something smaller, uh, more near term. And so that's where the supersonic UAV really came in. It's something that, you know, for a couple of tens of millions of dollars, you could develop a prototype uh, and then for a couple hundreds of millions of dollars, turn that prototype into a production product that you can just release out there 
for both the, the defense markets in addition to some commercial, uh, specifically commercial air combat training or adversarial air uh, markets. <clears throat> uh, and so this is a pivot we did roughly two years ago. Uh, we've started branching out into other avenues that we can apply supersonic UAV. Uh, some things that Vader mentioned earlier were aerial targets and collaborative combat aircraft systems. Uh, and so we've been building that over time and a lot of our newest contracts have been focused on developing our supersonic UAV out to, to tackle these government and commercial missions. And when you did that, when you were trying to kind of transition that technology mm -hmm. over, I assume you had some subject, or not some subject matter experts, but effectively people on the DOD side kind of helping you understand what exactly they were trying to have? Or did you kind of say like, hey, here's your UAV? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was a little bit of a little bit of both. Um, I remember our, there was a time in which I was like, I, I just really can't figure out what to use a supersonic UAV for. Uh, and that in a way is like a, a, a solution looking for a problem, uh, I think is the way to say it. Um, but, you know, we, I thought, I didn't even know how the idea popped into my head, but I thought, oh, wow, we, we got to train our Air Force pilots and they need to have something that's really relevant, right, to what adversaries are putting out there. Uh, and so a lot of adversaries have supersonic platforms that are pretty capable in terms of EA, Earth, and other capabilities like that. Uh, so we should have something like that that can mimic not only the capabilities, but also the speed of maneuverability of those uh, adversary platforms. And then I reached out to a number of these adversary air companies, uh, some through warm introductions, through just some just cold emails. And um, we got a few responses back and you know, they were they're fairly positive. They're like, I'm curious, I want to learn more. Uh, and then we talked to them about it. And, you know, pretty soon we started working with a few of them, uh, even to this day, which has been really cool. Uh, we brought on an advisor that I met, you know, around that time frame as well, quite fortuitously, named uh, retired general uh, Rob Blender Novotny, F-15 driver uh, in the past. And um, he's, you know, knew a lot about adversary air. He was at ACC doing plans, programs, requirements, knew about the, the pain of adversary air training and not having enough of it, especially he was running Nellis at the time, which does a lot of uh, really advanced air combat training uh, for the services. And, uh, you know, he helped form what this aircraft should look like, what it should do, helped introduce me to other people within the government, or at least indicated or pointed me towards people that I should go talk to. And so, you know, the conversations I've had with the adversary air uh, companies, uh, General Novotny with his own background and other folks within the DOD, like, you know, primarily Air Combat Command, some even from the, the Navy side, Marine Corps side of adversary air training, really helped shape what, what we think a supersonic adversary air UAV should do. When, you know, the, the Air Force has realized, I mean, even back when I was first starting to fly, that they were spending millions and millions of dollars sending their pilots up in their combat-capable aircraft to train against. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have an F-16 squadron, you have F-15 squadron. Effectively, half of the, the go, half of the jets taking off are going to get blue air training. And then half the other half of those jets are going to be the bad guys to get shot at. So okay. now you're you're putting miles on your planes. Your your pilots aren't available to do other stuff. So that transition into an adversary air makes sense. And I mean the Air Force, Ad Air, commercial airlines, everybody's struggling to find enough pilots to do the thing. So it it makes sense to kind of transition to hey how do we how do we make these unmanned uh, mm -hmm. and you know, I would assume people probably don't understand, like, why does it have to be a supersonic trainer? But yeah. the reality is, and then speaking from my side of it, is obviously the F-16, the, F, the F-15, they're fast airplanes. So if I'm fighting a jet that goes 0.6 Mach, then I can leave late. And while it's chase, chasing me down, in quotations, and I'm going the speed of sound away from it, Every 10 nautical miles I run, I gain four miles on that because I'm going to travel 10. He's going to travel six. Mm -hmm. And then so if I was like, oh, man, I'm, I'm a little too close to this bad guy. I just run for a little while, get away from him and then turn back in and I can, I'll be fine. Where 
if it's a training aid, a UAV, that can go supersonic or at least match the speeds that I'd be flying, then you don't you don't get a kind of cheat because the enemy's not going to allow you to do that. The enemy's not going to be like, oh, he's running cold. Let me slow down so he can get more range from me. So I think there's definitely a use case there. I just, I wonder if the Air Force understands that they they need to kind of, you got to do it. You know, you can't kind of half want to do it because I've heard recently that they've, they've made some decisions that are, that's kind of hubcapping or kind of handcuffing the the program or did they, they end it completely? What happened? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the DOD and air force millions of priorities and you know, they can only do several of the, the million out there. Right. Uh, and so uh, a lot of the focus has been um, on operational capabilities, right? How do we get something into the fight? And make sure that we can compete against um, our near peer adversaries like China and Russia. Uh, and so, you know, the the priority shifted away from training, uh, adversary air training specifically, and more in towards combat. Um, the debate about supersonic versus subsonic it seems to be more about well, what can we afford, right? I think there's a uh, a bad reputation for supersonic aircraft to cost a lot a, a lot of money, and I wouldn't blame them given that. You know, a lot of our supersonic aircraft programs like the F-35 and F-22 just are really expensive, you know, and there's some good reason that they are expensive and some not so good reasons why they are also that expensive. And so, you know, if that's been your experience, I can understand like, yeah, supersonic airplanes seem expensive, uh, but, you know, new companies, uh, different, you know, new technologies out there. they can probably make a difference. That's that's kind of what we're betting on at Exosonic because we can um, make a cost competitive supersonic platform and still meet the capabilities of what they're they're looking they're looking for. And I think I think we're in a weird spot where the Air Force is kind of the the DoD, but the Air Force specifically is kind of saying, "Hey, we can do a lot of our training in the sim." And as mm-hmm. as a person who's flown hundreds of hours flying different simulators and flying airplanes, the sim does not replicate the real flight. And maybe fifth gen can, but fourth gen fighters, which are going to be around for a long time, that you can't. Your trainers aren't good enough. The the physicality of actually flying the plane is is such that you don't get that in the sim. There's no there's none of that like internal like human survival instinct that's kind of overriding your training. That mm-hmm. happens in the sim because in the sim you're you're not as worried about hitting the ground or running jets into each other. So the fact that we're we're not you know poning up the dollars to to build a better training platform to allow our aging fleet to spend more time on blue air and less time on red air. I don't get it. I don't. Again, like you said, there's there's a lot of competing interests, uh, but I think sadly this is going to be one of those the kind of sine wave where we're at the point where they're going to say, Oh yeah, we, everything happens in the sim. And then in 10 years, you know, we'll sit back down and they're going to be like, the Sims aren't working. We got to fly everything again. And it's like, Oh man. Um, yeah. That's, it's tough. Cause as a company, how does that work? Like when, when you're like, cool, okay, we're going to do this. And then you pivot and then you put people and manpower and time and money and all these things into Hey, this is what we're going to do for you. And the Air Force is like, ah, thanks for no thanks. You know, like, <laughs> how do you do that as a company? Yeah, it's, uh, it's really difficult. And uh, it yeah. gives me a lot more appreciation for some of the structures that the Lockheeds that have built up, right? I mean, I talked to other uh, founders in the defense space where, you know, we're, we're single product companies in a way. We work on one thing at a time because that's what we have the resources to do. Uh, and so when when you know the U.S. government says, "Hey, thanks, but we're going to change our priorities," um, it's it's really hard, and you have to adjust, right? You have to new, do another pivot. In, in our case, we went from adversary air training, um, which has been basically supplanted by collaborative combat aircraft, and, and I understand why, uh, to aerial targets or next generation aerial targets, where there is a requirement for supersonic. Um, representation because our enemies are flying supersonic aircraft and we need to make sure our aircraft can hit those supersonic targets. Um, so that's where we've, we've gone uh, towards, but um, I mean, it's 
going back, it's it's really difficult to do to have the government change. Um, and when you think about the Lockheeds and the Boeing's of the world, right? When a program goes away, they can just put their people onto a different program that may be understaffed, uh, and they have these things called matrix organizations to allow that to happen, right? Whole whole teams, whole ma- sets of managers designed to keep their employees or engineers employed and shifting them from program to program as uh, ramp as programs ramp up and ramp down. Uh, so that's kind of you know the the structure that the Lockheeds and the Boeing's have it. That makes it okay for the government to change their minds on a dime. But for a startup, there's a lot more to adapt to, uh, and it's certainly harder. And some companies, just frankly, just don't make it because they put all their eggs into that one basket because that's all the resources they have. Uh, and, you know, you change your mind and there goes a business. When, and you could probably speak to this better than I can, but, you know, it's it's kind of like, is there a market for this product, you know? Mm-hmm. and. And so you can look out and do, I don't know, surveys or however you want to assess whether there is a market, an interest, people that will create a worthwhile opportunity to create a business around something. Mm -hmm. But the DOD is very weird because it's a, it's a single market and they either make the market or they break it. So it's like, oh yeah, there's totally a market. And then they, they turn around and it's like, oh yeah, it turns out market's gone. So that's, uh, that is frustrating, but I do, I do agree like a, you know, when I'm shooting missiles at a subscale drone and if it's flying slow, if it's doing all those things slow, again, like that missile is not having to do what it would if it was going after a fighter type airspeeds, fighter type altitudes, all those kind of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's because, you know, it's in you can sit there and say like, oh, yeah, it's it'll make it happen. Like, yeah, it hit the it hit the Mach 4 drone, but uh, it'll hit the Mach <laughs> 1 drone. And you're like. I don't know. It seems like that probably wouldn't be the same same problem set. But that's yeah. good that you guys were able to kind of move into a different area. Yeah. I do want to make a comment on that market. Uh, so, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, yes, I, I think generally if the U.S. government doesn't buy it, then there's no market. But what we're seeing also is the U.S. government, government get FOMO, right, uh, with some technologies. And so... We're like, hey, you know, our country has has gone back and forth with hypersonics uh, for a very long time. In fact, when I was working at Northrop Grumman in 2015, a lot of my coworkers made fun of me for working on hypersonics. And I said, no, this is it. This is finally the time to come uh, for hypersonics to come. It's not going to just be a fad. And the reason why is because our adversaries have hypersonic uh, missiles, right? Or their fielding capabilities that have that. Uh, and, and so... It's interesting to see markets form in reaction to what our competitors have, right? Uh, and that's very clear with hypersonics. And in, in a way, it seems like I mean, we've dropped the ball on it. I mean, X-51, amazing piece of uh, technology developed there. And we've effectively started over, which is which is honestly pretty sad to see. Uh, and China, they don't need to start over because they continue building on past success. And, and that's just incredibly intimidating in a way. And I think our senior leadership in the U.S. military know that. Um, and they're trying to do it and trying to catch up. But the problem is in a you know nation state combat, right? It's not about catching up. It's about accelerating and taking over. Uh, and so we need to position our country uh, to do that. And um, yeah, we need to make some firm decisions and certainly difficult decisions when, and I think, you know, again, you, you can't, I can't even imagine the level of stress and competing interests. I mean, think, I assume like a CEO of a, of a company, stuff like that, where there's so many things that are, you know, congressionally driven, co- Congress holds money, you know, DOD is just trying to like get access to it. And yeah. so we spent 20 years fighting a ground game in Iraq and Afghanistan, Syria, and And so we, our focus was all air to ground, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're trying to convince people like, I promise you hypersonics are going to be a thing in the future. And they're like, I don't know, you got a hypersonic bomb that I can uh, launch at this, uh, you know, from a plane to this target on the ground, because that's all we were focused on. And I think it's showing now. I mean, we talked about the age of our fleet and how other countries 
are accelerating in their progress because they're already on step. They've hit that point where they're they're getting that positive feedback in their production, and we're we're trying to learn. We're trying to just get up to speed uh, in these capabilities because we weren't worried about it. It was a very asymmetric war for the for most people's entire careers. Mm-hmm. To now we have a problem of, hey, we need technology, but not just any technology. We need groundbreaking technology that has never existed before that can do things that are eye-watering from distances that we've never thought about warfare previously. So I'm I'm glad people like you were trying to do that previously and and finally they're listening and and moving into that. With uh the CCA so the com- combat collaborative aircraft uh is that is it a stealth type thing or or how does that work? Cuz I mean with a CCA do you do you need it to be stealth? Does it, you know what I mean? Like if anybody's going to be shot, I hope it's my CCA and not me. Right. So, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. 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 Don't, so, tell, don't tell the CCA I said that. Yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't know. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, they'll do whatever you want. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the line is everything is classified around CCA. Uh, but yeah, so I can't really guess myself, but I imagine it's going to be something like kind of fifth gen or between fifth gen and sixth gen. Uh, in terms of cell capabilities, um, yeah, obviously it's going to have to have, you know, probably long ranges as well because of where our focus is on, which is the Indo-PACOM theater. So, yeah, it's going to be, a, I imagine, a pretty capable aircraft. Uh, but with that, hopefully it's going to be affordable, but we'll see what affordable means. You know, it's a matter of, okay, I want everything on it, but I want it for the price of a, a Chevy, you know, a, a Corolla. But, uh, you know, it doesn't always work out like that. Well, and how do you kind of, because because I understand the end user perspective where mm-hmm. I'm like, I need it to do X, Y, Z. I need the spinning rims. I need it, all the capes. But then you're like, okay, well, that's going to come with all the capes price tag. Like how right. do you provide that product and kind of have that conversation with the, with the customer and say, you you don't want that because it's going to cost you this. Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, what I imagine, and this is how we how we think about it too, uh, is that it's going to all become trade offs, right? It's like, okay, we need to come armed with data about what does it cost, you know, in terms of vehicle performance and actual dollars and other capabilities, right, to get what you want, right? It's like if you really want to have this on it. Well, you're gonna to have to give up some range, or give up some endurance, or or give up some you know speed. Um, you know, if you want if you want to go a little bit faster, then you know you have to give up this much payload because you have to swap payload for fuel and, and things like that. And so, ultimately, you know, we we aren't the decision makers. We are the ones that design the product for the customer. And so, if the customer ultimately says, "Hey, I want this versus that, and I'm willing to pay for that," then that's what we have to assume is going to be correct. But I know that's not ideally how it works. Um, I've heard there's these funny videos on YouTube about scope creep, about how this tank became this giant, massive, over-budgeted, totally weaponized thing that doesn't even move because it's so laden with <laughs> with payloads and weaponry and stuff. <laughs> um, and that was like a 1990s video, and it's still probably true to this day. Oh, for sure. Well, I saw it in... Uh, So I was an innovation lead uh, before I left the active duty side and uh, it, it was comical because I would bring an innovation company much like yourself, you know, on a cyber contract and uh, in, and we do like three or four meetings in the day, you know, we try to get all the parties and at each meeting, everyone would ask for different capabilities and it always make you laugh because the company knows always like, oh, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, we can do that. And over and over. And that's what ends up happening is like people ask and they're like, oh, you know, it'd be a great idea. You know, and you're like, stop. Just <laughs> like we're looking for a min viable product. Can we right. just like sit there? And I think because the the DOD on average is so far removed from the the, you know, storyboarding to the you know wireframes to the mock-ups to the mvp to the production capability like all that process they don't know they're just asking for a capability and someone wants to obviously get a contract but provide them that capability so then what ends up happening is they 
they agree to things. And these people probably don't even know how much headache they're doing. But I don't know if you saw it when you were at uh, Lockheed or Northrop, but maybe maybe you got kind of got shielded from this. But I feel like that happens across the DOD is is you just you keep changing your mind. You keep asking for new things. And because our changeover is 12 to 24 months, you know, a product takes a decade to come through. So it's every 12 to 24 months, you're getting new marching orders, which has to be insane. Yeah. I mean, we, we saw this in the very short time that our company has been around with, you know, uh, adversary air UX or, you know, the adversary air, air UAV and that had a set of requirements and then proves, Ooh, that's gone. Aerial targets. Oh, new set of requirements. Uh, okay. Then let's start over basically. So, um, yeah, it's, I, I didn't believe that in, in the short time that I've been doing this business that I had already have witnessed change so quickly. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> I guess the government can move fairly quickly when they want to. Yeah. And that's what, what I've seen is, especially the special operations side of the house, mm-hmm. they get, I mean, they get blank checks, you know? Mm-hmm. So they're like, hey, we need this capability to exist. And then companies produce it and they buy it. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, uh, I think it's called a late to need or something. Uh, there's some, you know, staffer term for it. Uh, but it's effectively like, I don't have to do the normal contracting because mm-hmm. I need this yesterday. Yeah. And they buy it. And there has been so much downstream from that and uh, where soft will get an upgrade to something. And then three years later, they're like, hey, they're putting that on the F-16 now. And you're like, oh, better late than never. When that's happened with the Air National Guard, the Air Force will say, hey, I don't want the F-15C, which is a plane I fly now, and the F-16 have both gotten radar upgrades because the Air National Guard bought it, implemented it. And then the Air Force, like you said, got FOMO and was like, okay, fine, we'll do it. So the Air National Guard was putting uh, ESA radars in F-16s in 2015. Oh, wow. And the, <laughs> That's a lot yeah. <laughs> and the Air Force just started doing that in 2022. And so you think about it like that. That's what happened. They, they're. Nobody forced their hand. They just showed them the reality of like, hey, this is what you're missing out on. And they're like, oh, that is pretty dope. Yeah, I'll take 200. <laughs> So uh, we've kind of gone on a negative path and we got to get back after this. So Norris, let's, let's end this on a positive note. What positives can we take away about Exosonic, the stuff we're building and, uh, and kind of the future of how we're going to change the game? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, <laughs> not, not to, not to react too much on this government in a way. Yeah. I mean, we've benefited a lot and we wouldn't be around without, without the civil process and the support that we've received so far. Um, you know, I think it's just understanding the realities of, of the system and working around that, right? And once you know the rules of the game, the rules of engagement, then you, you adapt and then you work through that, right? And um, <clears throat> with aerial targets, that's been really awesome. And we love our customer. Um, they're really great to us. And um, we want to continue doing good work for them. Now, I didn't get to mention this earlier, but we did develop a subscale vehicle uh, called the X3M Trident. It's a basically quarter scale of our supersonic UAV. And uh, we you know, went from design to completing manufacture of that vehicle in nine months time. And we've been going through this flight test program um, since the beginning of summer, and we're hopefully gonna close it out soon. So we're really looking forward to that vehicle flying off very soon. It's gonna be an autonomy test bed and show some autonomy capabilities that we'd like to have in our supersonic UAV for air combat training, aerial targets, CCA, anything uh, that's basically anything tactical. Uh, and so, yeah, want to get that flying out there. Um, interestingly, um, you know, like I said earlier, US government is a market, but there's also other markets too that you just have to be creative. You know, we have allies. Our allies are also looking for capabilities that they don't have today, uh, even more advanced capabilities because of the threats out there. Uh, in addition to, you know, representation in the commercial world through our air combat training partners. So with this flying vehicle, we hope to um, just engage in people in different ways and show our Air Force customers that we can not only design airplanes, but we can build them too and get them to fly. 
Yeah. Awesome. Well, I saw the, uh, the video of the Trident. It looks pretty sick. So I'll, uh, I'll add it in one of our clips, but Norris, thank you very much for being here today. Um, and, uh, we appreciate it. We appreciate what you're doing and, and building for, uh, for future me's who are uh, going to fight the good fight. So, uh, everybody, uh, remember like, share, subscribe. Uh, if you want to email us, um, then info at kodiakshack.com and then check out the website, kodiakshack.com, uh, where you can check out the swag shop, uh, get a hat. Maybe we'll make some polos. Who knows? You know, the world is our oyster. And, uh, Norris, if you want people to reach out and, uh, contact you, how can they, uh, get in contact with you or the company? Yeah, for sure. We're pretty active on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, or I guess X, formerly Twitter, uh, oh. Facebook and Instagram. Uh, but otherwise, you can always shoot an email at info at exosonic.com um, or, you know, Vader, you know, have him, uh, you can reach out to him and reach out to me that way. But i uh, love to talk to you and hear your thoughts about what we're doing here uh, and just any feedback that you have as well. We're always open to hearing people's comments and questions. Awesome. Well, thanks, Norris. Bye, everybody.